Hallelujah. Good morning. Welcome to Word of Life online, where the presence and the Spirit of God is here. Hallelujah. And we honor him. We honor that presence. We honor the Spirit of God this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody just give him a praise. Give him all the glory, the honor that is due his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is joy in the house of God. There's joy in his presence. There's freedom. There's liberty in the presence of God. Come on, wherever you are, just begin to praise him and worship him. Hallelujah. Because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, put those hands together. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. There is a river flowing, river of joy and laughter. We want to swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is a river flowing, a river of joy and laughter. We want to swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. There's a river flowing, river of joy and laughter. Swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is a river flowing, a river of joy and laughter. We want to swim in the waters, we want to dance. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy, there is joy in the house of the Lord, there is joy in the house of the Lord, there is joy, there is joy. Freedom reigns in the house of the Lord. Freedom reigns as we dance. Freedom reigns in the house of the Lord. Freedom reigns as we dance. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy. There is joy. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house.
house of the Lord, there is joy. There is joy. Hay libertad en la casa de Dios. Hay libertad en la casa de Dios. Hay libertad. Hay libertad. Hay libertad en la casa de Dios. Hay libertad en la casa de Dios. Hay libertad. Hay libertad. Aleluya. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your joy. We thank you for your peace, your love, and your kindness towards us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you for being a way maker and a miracle worker. Father, a promise keeper. And you're our light in the darkness. Father, we love you today. Hallelujah. Jesus. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, everybody, say we make a we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Is my God, that is who you are. We make we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Come on, let's declare that again. We make, we make a miracle work. Promise keeper. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Come on, let's say it again. We make, we make a miracle work. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are.
Come on, lift it up again. Say we make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Come on, just lift your worship up to him right now. God, we bless your name. We lift your name high. That is who you are. Oh, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper. My God, that is who you are. Come on, lift it up again. Said away this morning we bless your great name on this morning a name above all names we bless your great name this morning we are honor you father because you're great and you're deserving of great praise great worship Come 
Everybody declare again. Say, great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Come on, let's say it. It's your breath. It's your In our lives. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. your great God great worship because of who he is not because of just what he's done but because of who he is he's an awesome king he's an awesome king he's an awesome king he's an awesome king who is the king of glory the Lord strong and mighty he's an awesome king he's an awesome king and we declare great are you Lord Great are you, Lord. Welcome to Word of Life Online. So glad you're here today. We're about to go into God's Word, but before we do, I have a few announcements for you. As you know, at Word of Life, we are connected with Tree of Life Ministries in Leesburg, and we're believing God to start Tree of Life right here in Sterling. But in the process of time, until that takes place, we're connected with Tree of Life. This week, starting Tuesday morning from 8 to noon, Tuesday through Friday, we're going to be receiving groceries here at Word of Life. I sent you out an email this week about it, but I want to encourage you and remind you, bring your groceries by. There's going to be a bin and a tent outside of our building. You're not going to have to touch anybody. You're not going to have to spread any disease. Just drop it in the bin and take off. We'll take care of it from there. But please help us help the poor during this season. Today is Mission Sunday. It's Palm Sunday, but it's also Mission Sunday. And right now we have a few words from one of the missionaries we support in Madrid, Spain, an area that's being hit really hard with coronavirus, but she's got some words to encourage you this morning. I know that you, like me, right now are bombarded with an avalanche of information. You probably have the news going 24-7 with actual information and a whole lot of opinion. You may be sharing in your social media infographics on disease prevention and disease spread and projections and updated figures and facts. And I know it's overwhelming. And that's why we have to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Above everything else, above any other information that you're getting, above all the other avenues of things that can be filling your mind, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're meditating on, the Bible also says in 2 Corinthians that we have to take captive every thought. And that is important because that means that we are choosing to put those things lower so that the peace of Christ will rule and be above everything else, that it will have the sovereignty. 
So I encourage you here from Madrid where we're on day four of lockdown and already feeling pretty stir crazy that this verse, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart is something that you can use as an anchor in the coming days, no matter where you are in your quarantine journey. Maybe you're just beginning. Maybe you're further along than I am here in Madrid. It doesn't matter. All that matters is the peace that Christ has given us that says, I've already overcome the world. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Let that peace rule in your heart and in your world today. It's time for us to give to the Lord. And as we do today, I want to remind you that it is Mission Sunday. And I want you to remember your mission's faith promises. Our missionaries still need our support, even during COVID-19. So I want to encourage you, above your tithes and offerings, click that missions tab and uh, designate some of your giving to missions today. For our regular giving, go to our website. Click that give button in the top corner and uh, help us continue to get the gospel out. Our missionaries need us now more than ever before. A lot of our missionaries are in isolation right now. A lot of our missionaries are struggling. Matter of fact, the head of the World Missions Department for the Assemblies of God is uh, fighting COVID. He's fighting for his life with COVID-19 right now. I want to pray for him and receive this offering together. Will you pray with me? Father, right now, I pray for your people. God, I pray for those who are struggling right now, who have been limited in their resources because of COVID-19. God, I pray that you will abundantly supply for your people in this house. And God, I pray that you will supply enough that we can help people around the world. God, we pray together for Greg Mundus today and his wife. And God, we pray, Lord, we come against this virus globally, God, this global pandemic. We say, God, stop this thing in its tracks. God, we ask you let the spread stop, let it come to a halt. But God, we pray for our missionaries around the world today. God, will you encourage our missionaries? Will you help them? God, as they're quarantined, as they're isolated, God, I pray that you would step in and move on their behalf. Let this offering today be a blessing to them in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be in the house today. It's good to be in your house today. Hey, it's Palm Sunday and we're not able to be together. So I got to be the only one waving palm branches today, but I'm going to wave them for my Jesus anyway. And uh, today, you know, I was thinking about something this week. I almost asked you all to show up and, you know, our palm branches, we order them a long time ago before there was a thing called coronavirus. And so we got hundreds of these things that were ready to go today. And uh, I almost said, you know what, let's do a parade. Let's get all of our cars and let's get palm branches and drive through Loudoun County waving palm branches. And y'all know I'm a little bit crazy, but that's all right. You still love me anyway, and I still love you. And uh, no, we couldn't do that because we're supposed to not leave our homes except for essential business. And even though I consider that essential, but today I'm going to bring a message to you from Palm Sunday, but it takes a little bit of a different, a different avenue today. Palm Sunday is when we wave palm branches and celebrate all Jesus did for us. But today I want to talk about the ride he took on that day. You see, it wasn't an easy ride. It was a, a ride that was a little bit difficult. And if you have a Bible today, I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 says these words. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He's humble. He's riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and they threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Verse number eight says this, Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him 
and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heavens. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they ask? And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Right there this morning in your home, I want to bring you this message, and I'm calling it The Ride. I'm talking about, talking about the ride that Jesus took into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And I got some things that I want to share with you about the ride. And a lot of times on Palm Sunday, we wave palm branches, we shout victorious shouts, and we, we highlight the verse that says, you know what, if these people are quiet, the very rocks will shout out. We love those. I'm Pentecostal to the core. And I'll tell you right now, I love Palm Sun. I love celebrating. I love dancing around and shouting out. And I love saying, hey, if we don't praise him, the very rocks are going to cry out. But I'm going to talk about a different part of the story today. I'm going to talk about the ride into Jerusalem. Because the ride into Jerusalem that day for Jesus wasn't a very victorious ride. Matter of fact, he knew what was coming in the next five to seven days. He knew what was going to be happening on Good Friday. Matter of fact, he knew that the same people who were shouting Hosanna on that day would also be screaming, crucify him just about five days later. He realized that the same people who were waving palm branches and declaring glory to God in the highest and all of the people shouting that day, Jesus understood something as he was taking a ride that day. He was riding on a donkey, a, 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 a donkey of humility and brokenness and he's riding into Jerusalem and he's not shouting victorious shouts. He's thinking, I know what's coming. I know that I'm about to pass through the most difficult season of my life. I know that I'm going to be betrayed. I know that I'm going to be crucified. I know that my beard's going to be plucked out and they're going to put a crown of thorns in my head. While he's on the ride into Jerusalem, I want you to think about this. He had the ability to say, you know what, I'm not going to take this ride. He had the ability to say, I know what's coming in the coming week. I, I know what's coming in Passion Week, but... Because of you and me, he took a ride on Palm Sunday. He took a ride that he would never forget. He took a ride knowing the potential outcome, knowing what was going to happen to him. I don't know about you, but as I would take that ride, I would be thinking probably sarcastically, these same people are going to be screaming crucify him in a few days. He was, he was God in the flesh, so he knew what was coming. He knew he was going to be on a cross just a few days from now, yet he took the ride anyway. The first thing I want you to see about the ride, and if you hold your Bible in Matthew and you move over to Isaiah chapter 53, the remainder of our message today is going to come from Isaiah chapter 53 because... When we talk about the ride, I want you to see what he was riding into. You see, in 2020, we have had a couple of months now of, of some really difficult times, some very trying times that are going on in the world around us, and we don't negate that. We don't say, hey, it's not happening, and faith doesn't say there's not an issue, but faith says, you know what, I'm I might have to go through some stuff. I might have to go through some trials. I might have to go through some tribulations. But I know this. I know that in the midst of it, that God's still got a plan. God's still got a future. God's still got a destiny for me. And so I might need to go through some difficult times. The first thing I want you to see as we move over to Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to talk about his ride into Jerusalem that day. Because in his mind, he knew what was coming. He already understood he knew when they were shouting hosanna that things were about to change in the coming days but isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 says this he was oppressed and treated harshly yet he never said a word he was led on that ride like a lamb to the slaughter matter of fact in the book of matthew when it, it says that he came in it says that he came in in the middle of the procession 
And that literally is the procession of the lambs. The lambs that were coming into Jerusalem for Passover, the lambs that were going to be sacrificed on that Palm Sunday, they would bring in what they called the procession of the lambs. And all of the sheep, all the sheep that had been prepared for sacrifice would be coming through the gate and Jesus was in the middle of the procession. Jesus was in the middle of all the sheep and that's why Jerusalem was an uproar. What is this guy doing in the middle of the procession of the sheep? What is this guy doing with all of the Passover lambs? Why is he in the middle of all of the Passover lambs? You see, he knew that ride was a difficult ride. And even though they're waving palm branches and they're throwing down their coats, he's in the middle of a bunch of sheep. He's on his way to the, with the sheep to sacrifice. But it says this, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter in that procession of the lambs. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he didn't open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. I want you to see as Jesus is taking the ride, the first thing I want you to write down about the ride is the ride was difficult. If you're on our church app today, I want you to highlight the ride was difficult. Isaiah 53, 7 to 9. Jesus knew what was coming on Good Friday, but he took the ride anyway. Jesus knew, hey, it's a difficult season that I'm going into, but I'm not going to decide to just say, you know what, I'm going to go another way. He didn't do what Jonah did and say, I'm going to go the opposite direction of what God's calling me to do. Jesus said, I'm going to take the ride on their behalf. I'm going to ride into Jerusalem and I'm going to lay my life down that week for them. Verse number seven says he was oppressed. He was treated harshly. He didn't even say a word. He was unjustly condemned. Nobody cared that he died without descendants. And his life was cut down at only 33 years of age. He had only lived at that time about half of his life. At that time, the life range was much shorter than now. And 33 would be about half of a life. Jesus only got to live half of a life. Isaiah 53 says that he wouldn't even have, be able to have descendants that he could look back on that were taking a life away from him and he was treated wrong. Can I tell you that sometimes the hard way is the only way. Sometimes the hard way is the only way that we're going to see the, 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 we're going to get to where God wants us to get. And sometimes there's not an easy way around it. Jesus could have said, I don't want to take this ride into Jerusalem. I, I'm going to go hang out with Mary and Martha for a while and Lazarus, who I raised from the dead. I'm just going to go somewhere else. But he chose the difficult ride. And sometimes the hard way is the only way. Sometimes, church, there's not an easy way. In the midst of coronavirus, COVID-19, sometimes we got to walk through some things. And if we're going to take the ride, we got to look at our Jesus and realize he took a difficult ride knowing things weren't getting any better immediately. He knew that things were about to get very hard, yet he did it anyway. Jesus knew how difficult things would become, but he took the ride Anyway, look at the children sitting across from you. Look at your spouse. Look at somebody else who's in the room in your house there with you right now and say he took the ride anyway. He did it for us. He did it for a purpose. There was a reason he took that ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He knew it was going to be difficult, but he did it anyway. He had the power to run during a difficult time, but he took the ride anyway. He took the ride anyway. He walked into difficult situations. He didn't look for a way out of it. He said, I've got to go face a cross. And the only way to that cross is to come in with the procession of the lambs and be the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I'm going to have to be offered on Passover just like the rest of those sheep there. The Bible says that Jesus didn't open his mouth. Can I tell you something? I want to highlight this. When Jesus was going through his trial, 
He didn't get on social media and tell everybody, hey, look at poor me. Look what I'm going through and how terrible life is. Can I tell you, if you're going through something today, you don't have to be all over social media telling everybody your business. Jesus went quietly. He went as a lamb. As a lamb is, is dumb or quiet or silent before its shearers, so was Jesus. He didn't broadcast everything that was in his mind that day. I can imagine running through his mind as he's, as he's taking that ride into Jerusalem. I could imagine what was going through his mind. I could imagine him thinking, I'm about to be sacrificed and these people are shouting Hosanna. I could imagine what was going on in his mind at that time, but he didn't say nothing. He didn't say, hey, this is wrong or this is right. or He didn't do anything about it. He just went as a lamb. He was struck down, the Bible says, for other people's rebellion. He had done no wrong, but they treated him like a criminal. He could have cried justice. He could have shouted, I deserve better than this. He could have fought for his rights. He could have demanded his rights and say, hey, I'm not a criminal. I can prove it. I've got attorneys ready to fight my battle. But Jesus didn't. He zipped his lip. He didn't fight for his rights. He went as a criminal to a cruel cross. And it says he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. And so this was a difficult ride he was taking. He knew he was going to be struck down for something he didn't do. He was going to be struck down for something that he couldn't be accused of. And they couldn't rightly find accusation against him. And so the first thing I wanted to tell you is the ride was difficult. And your ride through life might not be easy. And it might not be simple and it might be a difficult ride. But can I tell you, Jesus already took a ride so that so that on the third day after he was crucified, he resurrected. And that life giving Jesus is with us today. No matter what kind of ride life takes us on, Jesus is going to be with us on the ride. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Jesus is right there with you in the middle of your ride right now in the middle of your COVID-19 ride he's there on the journey right now because he took a ride for you the second thing I want you to see about the ride is seen in verse number 10 the ride was not only difficult but the ride was destined the ride was destined matter of fact Isaiah 53 10 says it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him Grief. I want you to, to just let that sink into your mind. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. you got to think about this for a moment. Wait a second. No, the plans that God has for us are plans to prosper us and bless us and give us hope in a future. Listen, the plans of God will sometimes allow you to go through difficulties. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 lets me know that Jesus riding into Jerusalem, it was predestined to happen. There was a destiny on his life. Some things are destined to happen. Some things you can rebuke all day long, but they're not going to go anywhere because God has ordained them to take place. Some things we can't just rebuke it. It's got to change. Some things we got to go through. Some rides we got to take even because they're, we're destined to take them. Zechariah 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious. Yet he's humble. He's riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And then Isaiah says it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. Sometimes you're going to ride through difficult situations and circumstances that you don't understand. And in that place, we've got to trust God who knows the end from the beginning, who knows where you're going and knows what your future holds. At some point, we got to say, God, I'm going to trust you with my future. I'm going to trust you with my destiny. And so some things are just ordained to happen. Some difficulties in life are going to come. People are all wondering, is this COVID-19? Is this coronavirus? Is this God's judgment? Is this the devil? What is this? And, and listen, you know what? We don't understand, but I know this. God knew it before the foundations of the world. God knew where we would be at this time. And so some rides are just destined to happen. 
Some things are going to happen that are beyond our control. Some things are going to happen that we have no control over because it is written it's going to take place. You know, I wish I could tell you things are just going to get better and better and everything's going to be wonderful throughout the eternal future and, and it's just going to be wonderful stuff all the way into glory land. But my Bible says in the last days it's going to get rough. There's going to be difficult times. Paul told Timothy, he said, in the last days, perilous times will come. Difficult times will come. God has a plan. And in the, in the last days, there's going to be difficult times. I wish I could tell you, you could just faith your way out of it. But some things are destined to happen. Some things we're going to have to walk through. Some things we're going to have to take a ride whether we want to take that ride or not. And sometimes when you take, you're going to take a ride through difficult circumstances, you've got to learn to trust God. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen on the other side of the virus. He knows what's coming in the future. And so we've got to realize that God has a plan. And parts of that plan are difficult. Parts of that plan where we're not going to be able to under, understand Listen, some of you have been through some difficult seasons in your life. Some of you went through child abuse. Some of you went through spousal abuse. Some of you have been through horrific things in your life and you don't understand. And you look at it and say, if God has a plan to bless me and prosper me and give me a future and a hope, what in the world is going on right now? Why am I dealing with the things that I'm dealing with right now? Listen, parts of God's plan are not always easy. Parts of God's plan are difficult. This ride for Jesus into Jerusalem, he knew what he was facing, yet he did it anyway. And sometimes the plans of God for your life are not easy. But you know what? The harder something is to achieve, the harder you go through something, the more you appreciate the victory on the other side. And so if things never get difficult, you'll never have a testimony. You can't have a testimony without a test. You can't have a triumph without a trial. You can't have a victory without some vicious thing happening, without something negative. And so we all like to give testimony of the incredible moves of God and the incredible healings and miracles, but... We wouldn't need a miracle if there wasn't trials in our life. Sometimes the plans of God for you are destined. Some of you walked through things that nobody should ever have to walk through. And the fact is, you don't know the future, but God does. And He knew you had to walk that path so that one day you could minister out of your grief, out of your healing, out of the fact that God healed you and you came through it. You'd be able to look at somebody else and say, you know what? I went through the same thing. I've been there. And you can now tell them, hey, on the other side of this ride, it's going to get better. You're going to make it. You're going to get through this season. You see, if you just only had the good things in life and God just made all the plans work out perfectly and everything went well for you, you'd never have a testimony to share with somebody who's going through a difficult time. There are some things you have to go through now for future benefit. You say, Pastor Jeff, what lies on the other end of this coronavirus? You know, in 1986, somebody I respect highly, David Wilkerson, in 1986 prophesied that there was a prop, there was a, a plague coming to the globe that would especially hit New York City and that New York City would be shaken by this thing and that New York City would be a, a prime area of this thing. But he said that during that shaking, people who were prayerless would begin to pray and people who were away from God would begin to repent and preachers would begin to pre preach repentance again of sin. And there would be at the end, he said, it's going to be difficult, but he said at the end of it the third great awakening is coming to the United States of America and after that there's going to be a global revival listen we're going to walk through this thing and it might not be easy in the next few weeks it might not be easy but on the other side of it there is a victory that's coming on the other side of it revival's coming can I just stand up and tell you we may go through some tough times but I'm telling you God's about to move on this planet God's about to do some things that you never dreamed possible God's going to raise up his church in this hour and we're going to see a move of God like we never dreamed possible it's coming church but we may have to go through some things we may have to take a ride through some difficult times there are some things you're going to have to go through now for future benefit 
at the end of this thing, we're going to see revival and awakening. We're seeing it now by all the people clicking on and lost people are searching and Googling prayer and they're searching and Googling how do I find God and it's happening right now. There's a move of God that's happening because of this virus. So at the end of this revive virus, when we're talking about the third great awakening in the United States of America, when we're talking about that last day's revival that we've prophesied for years, when we're one day telling our kids about it, we're going to look and say, you know what? We had to go through this thing called a coronavirus. We had to go through this quarantine and this isolation. And we had to take a ride and a journey we didn't want to take. But in the middle of the journey, God began to call us to prayer and fasting and God began to call us to do some things that we were not ready for. The ride was difficult. The ride was destined. But third, the ride was desirable. You say, what do you mean the ride was desirable, Pastor Jeff? He was about to go in toward his crucifixion. He was going to go into the most difficult time of his life. But here's why the, the ride was desirable. It starts in 10b. 10a said, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. Just prior to that, here's, here's what we read about Jesus. It said that he would never have descendants. He died. Nobody cared. In, in verse number 8, it says that his life was struck short and nobody cared that he died without descendants. But then just a few verses later, it says, when his life is made an offering from sin, he will have many descendants. Why is it desirable that he would go take that ride into Jerusalem with all the sheep that day. Why is it desirable? Because he's going to have many descendants. Maybe not flesh and blood. Maybe not sons and daughters as we know sons and daughters, but you and I are direct descendants. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, when you accept what He did for you on that cross, you become a descendant of the Most High. And so Jesus received many descendants. And then He continues and says, He will enjoy a long life. Matter of fact, it's an eternal life. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. God's good plan, it said, was to crush him. But in the midst of the crushing, it says God's good plan would prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many, you and me, to be counted righteous. He will bear all their sins. Verse number 12, I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and he interceded for rebels. Why was the ride desirable, Pastor Jeff? Number one, the future impact was worth the present suffering in Jesus' mind. He realized that many descendants, he realized when he looked from that cross, when he was riding into Jerusalem thinking I'm crazy for going what I'm doing, what I'm going to do in the next five days is ridiculous. What I'm going to do in the next seven days is going to cause hurt for me, but there's going to be some descendants down the road who I'm going to suffer on their behalf. I'm going to take some penalty for their sins and I'm going to lay it on my body i'm going to take all of the sickness all the suffering all the disease i'm going to put it on my body and i'm going to let my body be sacrificed how's it desirable so that they can be healed so that they can be made well you see the future impact was worth the present suffering it is easier to ride through something when you know that someone else is going to benefit from it in the future you know if you die without a cause if you die without a cause, you feel like, man, you lived a life that, that, that didn't amount to anything. But if I die so that somebody down the road is going to have it better. If I die for a cause, if I die knowing that my life was given to better somebody else. How do the military guys, how do they go into battle and our, our ladies and our men in the military. How is it they go into battle knowing they could die? Because they know they're dying to protect the freedoms of you and I. They know they're going to die facing something and bringing a good result out of something. They're giving their life for a cause. So if you know that, 
You can face difficult times because you know it's going to be better for somebody else in the future. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Jesus, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross and he disregarded the shame. At the end of his ride, he was going to make an offering for sin. At the end of his ride into Jerusalem, he was going to do some things. He was going to have many descendants. He said he would bear the sins of the people and he would be satisfied. He realized that, hey, men have been separated from God, but if I'll take this ride, if I won't bail on the ride, if I'll go through this next week of my life, if I'll go through this tough time, He said, you know what? Many will benefit. I'll have many descendants. Their sins will be eradicated. And as a result, many will be counted righteous. I think of the missionaries who've given their lives and didn't see much fruit with their lives. But generationally speaking, they sowed a seed and they died without seeing the harvest. But you go in and generations later, they see churches scattered everywhere. So many missionaries have given their lives because they were operating with a kingdom mindset that said, if I have to endure some things now, there's a future generation that's going to be blessed. And there's countless missionaries who have given their lives knowing that, hey, it doesn't seem like I'm making much of a difference. But if you think generationally, If you think distance, if you think that I'm paving a way and I'm planting a seed that's going to be harvested later, then you endure things with joy. You endure things much easier. He said, as a result, many will be counted righteous. And then the Isaiah 700 years before Christ, he says, I'm going to give him honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and he interceded for rebels. You say, Pastor Jeff, why did Jesus go through it? Why was he desirable? Why did this look desirable to him to, to take that ride into Jerusalem and it, that would culminate in his death on a cross? Why? He took the ride instead of running away from it because you were his reward. He took the ride into Jerusalem with all the sheep that day. He bore the sins of many and it says he interceded for rebels. You were a rebel and I was a rebel, but Jesus took the ride. He didn't run away that day because you were his reward. He was looking through time and eternity and even on this broadcast right now on Sunday morning, on Palm Sunday morning, Jesus took a ride for you. He took a ride saying, you know what? I'm about to walk into the hardest week of my life but I did it so that they can know me so that I can give them peace in the middle of coronavirus so that I can give myself to them so that they can have relationship with God Jesus did it for you you were his great reward Romans tells us for the joy set before him he endured the cross he went through and he took the ride for you wasn't an easy ride He knew the people who were shouting Hosanna were the ones who were going to shout crucify him. But he took the ride because he loved you. If you're watching this on on Facebook or YouTube or however you're watching it this morning, I want to tell you that if you were the only one on this planet, Jesus would have died for you. He would have taken that ride just for you. He, He said, hey, he's interceding for rebels and you might be rebellious. You might not be serving God today. You might not be where you need to be with God. Let me just give you this word. We're living in the very last days. I believe the last minutes on the historical calendar are right. I believe we're right at midnight. I believe we're very, very close to the coming of the Lord. And listen to those who are rebellious. Now's the time to turn around and say, God, I need you in my life. You've been far away from God. Now's the time to realize he took a ride for you. Will you take a ride for him? He took a ride for you so that you could have a pathway to God, so that you could have an avenue into the presence of God. And today, I want to challenge you. There's nobody, nobody like Jesus. There's nobody who, can, who took the punishment for your sins like he took. You say, Pastor Jeff, what do you got to do? To come into that relationship so that I can cry Hosanna. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So on Palm Sunday, I can wave the palm branches. And I can celebrate with everybody else what he did. 
How do I get to that place, Pastor Jeff? Here's how you do it. You say, Lord Jesus, I'm a rebel. I've been going, I've rebelled against your law. I've rebelled against your word. I've rebelled against what I knew to do. I've gone my own way and I've done my own thing. But I, today I repent of all that rebellion. Today I repent of all that rebellion. And I'm coming back to you, Jesus. I want you in my life. I want to be ready when the trumpet sounds and that rapture takes place. I want to be ready to meet you in the air, Lord, and be with you forever. I want to be ready. And so we're going to pray a prayer right now. And we're going to ask Jesus to come into our lives. He went through it all. He took the ride for you and for me. He took the ride so that you could have a better ride. He took the ride in the midst of trouble and trial. He took the ride nobody else wanted to take. He bore the sins of many and He interceded for rebels. My Bible says that right now He's been exalted to the right hand of God and that He ever lives to make intercession for you and me. Intercession means to come between two people. It, it means to, to come in the middle of two people. And so Jesus is in between you and God right now and He's making intercession for you. In other words, He's praying for you right now. I want our whole congregation right now in your homes to begin to pray for lost people right now. If you're watching in your home right now, if you're watching and you don't normally go to Word of Life, maybe you do, but if you're not in right relationship with Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. There's nothing magical about it. It's just a prayer of saying, God, I'm committing my life to you and I'm, re I'm, I'm not going to be a rebel anymore. I'm going to do it your way. Will you do it with me? Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I've gone my own way. I've done my own thing. I've, I've not served you. I've not lived the way you want me to live. And today I repent of it. And I come to you. And I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I ask you to come into my life. Give me hope and a future. I pray that your peace will enter my life. I want you in my life, Jesus. And from this day on, I'm going to do it your way instead of my way. Come into my heart. Live with me. Live big in me. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, I'm going to ask you to go to our website. Hit that contact button. Our website is wolashburn.org. Wolashburn. If you prayed that prayer with me, click that contact button. It's going to email me personally. Nobody else is going to see it. And just say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you. If you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you when this virus is over. I want to encourage you. Find a good church that's preaching God's word, that's telling the truth. Don't go to a place that's, that's watering down the truth. Be in a place where you're going to be convicted, where you're going to feel uh, conviction of your sins. And be in a place where there's fellowship and be part of a family. I want to encourage you to read the book of John. Start there. Start reading it. I want you to go to our website and find my daily wash on there. Start following that calendar, reading your Bible and applying it to your life. It's the only way to grow. You've got to get in God's word. For all of our regular attenders, our word of lifers, I want to encourage you. I'm not going to let the rocks out praise me in COVID-19. I'm not going to allow anything to outshout me in, in this season of difficulty and trial. But I want, to child, I want to encourage you with these words. I want to encourage you with these words right now. I want to tell you that, hey, greater days are ahead for the church. Greater days. The best days of the church are yet to come. And we're, we're taking a ride right now through a difficult season. But the best days are yet to come. They're coming, church. I promise you that. Right now, I want to bless you. I want to pray over you. Father, I thank you for this online service today. I thank you for every person who's watched. I thank you for every individual who's given their lives to Jesus today. I thank you for every member of Word of Life, every attender of Word of Life. I speak your protection over them. I speak your provision over them. I say, God, let no weapon formed against them prosper. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will keep them from any virus. God, I pray that you will keep them strong. But God, I also pray that in the middle of struggle, in the middle of trial, in the middle of tragedy, in the middle of this virus, Father, I pray your sustain grace for your people I pray that Lord that they would realize what's the, on the other side of this thing that they'd realize that I might have to ride through some things right now but the future is going to be better 
God, I pray that you would comfort everyone. I pray, God, that everyone would begin to connect one with another online, on telephone. God, through video chats, I pray that people would connect and engage in the body. And Father, I speak over your people that this week they will encounter Christ. They will lead others to encounter Christ, to engage in growth and extend your kingdom. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. I'll see you soon.